Yeah, I'm not always this grumpy, so it's fine. It's fine. So apparently we have the Icelander. So who is the Icelander? Well, I'm, my name is Olaf Oy. Good luck with that one. I've been living in Malmö for the last four years. Uh, I'm a senior programmer at Ubisoft Massive. Those who know, make games, work on Uplay. Well, it's echoey. Maybe I'll talk a little lower. It's fine. Uh, I am on the backend team of the Uplay PC project. Been there for about two years. So a lot of server work, a lot of async, dealing with hundreds of thousands of people wanting to play games. So that's fun. And I worked in the ATC industry before this, which is a completely different industry. So if you want to have hear some fun stories, ask me afterwards. Uh, a little bit about the talk itself. The structure is four stories about learning, in some sense. Um, if you can take away something from it, that would be wonderful. Um, they are different from one another, but all focused on learning. Mostly C++, I will have some fun later on. And again, teaching in some manner. But first, a little bit of preamble. Um, because learning is tricky, as you might know. Nobody, I think, I think I can say that this sentence is true. Nobody learns in the same manner. Um, this is not a black and white situation where one per group of people learn in one way and another group of people learn in another way. So we can think of this as a multidimensional problem. And there are kinds of categorizations about learning. Um, I'm only using them to help illustrate my point uh, because even within kind of the teaching community, most of, the categories, most of these categorizations are contested. So take these with a many grains of salt. Uh, there's one model which kind of works. It's called the VARC model, which is a visual learner, an auditory learner, read and write, and then kinesthetic. Go quickly over that. A visual learner likes abstract images, scribbling things into a notebook, drawing diagrams. An auditory learner learns by listening, asking questions for clarification, back and forth, group discussions, use of uh, mnemonic devices. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, for those who remember that one. I think it's still applicable. Like, there hasn't, uh, the order of operation hasn't changed, I think. Then we have the read and write, lots of notes, books, report, essays, reading papers, translating abstract ideas into text. So you take the visual idea and then write it all down. And then you have the kinesthetic, which I think we all are in a little bit. Learn by doing, repetition, lots of experiments, change, break things, figure out why. It's, I do a lot of the last one. So the first story is what I call mental models. So let's go back to my university. Let's imagine you all are me. We're at our university, first semester. We're about halfway through. Oops. It's programming 101. It's not called that, but it's fine. We're doing C++. And this picture here that I'm going to show is put up on the projector. And uh, I would love to see hands as soon as I put the picture up who recognizes this thing. Yeah. What is this? What's this called in C++? Any word? Pointer. Thank you. Who calls this a free store still? Nobody? <laughs> Many people call this a heap now. but uh, So this is implying that we have some box of an int, and it points over to a number five. So pointers. So back in that class, we had a two-hour class, whole two hours. And there was those two hours was nothing but those pictures with code on the side. It was that kind of picture and then code. And they were stepping through like a debugger through every single use case of a pointer. It's 195 slides. <laughs> Don't believe me? I found the thing <laughs> in my Dropbox backup. So you can see the little, little arrows and the code. OK. Now here's the thing. The speaker himself, totally fine. Going through the talk again, preparing for this, I looked through it. There's nothing wrong with it. All the information seemed to be correct. But I was completely lost. I had no idea what was going on. I mean, I knew what pointers were for. These 
we have data somewhere else, dynamic data, blah, blah, blah. I knew how to use them, kind of. But this talk was amazing for auditory and visual learners. So for me, I don't know which on the spectrum I am, but apparently that was not great for me. So any pointer exercise made me scared, like really scared. There was always this doubt in my mind that I was missing something. Like I could do the exercises, I saw the results, I, I tried something, I saw a thing crash, great. So I knew back then, this is many years ago, I knew pointers were in C. And the book we had for C++ was very this, um, this kind of thing with the arrows and pointing and all that stuff. So I knew pointers were in C. And I had a very legal copy of the C programming language. I think I'm uh, past the statutory limitations on this. Um, so let's figure this out. What does the book say about pointers? And by the way, the screenshot I'm going to show, again, like it is a copyrighted book, but I got uh, apparently the free sample you can get has exactly what I need. So where do you think pointers are in this book? Let's go to chapter one. Are pointers here? No. Yeah, getting started, variables, arrays. I mean, for us, we know it's kind of a pointer, but they're not talking about pointers. OK, it must be. It's got to be in chapter two. No, variable names, constants, type conversions, bitwise operations. OK, OK, it, it, it's the C language. It has to be in chapter three. No, control flow. Statements, if else, elf is, switch, do while, 3.8, go to's, good stuff. It's two pages. Okay, okay. What are we, we're not kidding ourselves. It's got to be in chapter four. No. Functions, scope rules, register variables, Re like recursion. <laughs> you learn recursion before pointers. If you think of it as, Let's say I'm back in the day, I'm reading the C++ programming language book, and I'm about halfway done with the book. And I, so someone asks me, like, hey, are you learning C? Yeah, I'm learning C. How far are you? I'm about halfway through. So how do you think about pointers? Huh? I'm, I'm great at recursions, but I don't know what you're talking about. It's got to be in chapter 5. There we go. Chapter 5. Pointers and arrays. Address arithmetic. Yeah, let's do four pages on that one. It's great. But page 93, chapter 5, how long is this book? Well, I had the rest of the index. It's 185 pages. And don't worry, I did the math for you. It's 50.27% of the book. So you learn about pointers in the C language. Like you can learn half the language without touching pointers. Cool. So, me, back in that day, I went to page 93. I read the first sentence, and then I put the book down, because it was exactly what I was missing. So we see page 93. It's only the first line. You should go by the book. A pointer is a variable that contains the address of a variable. After 195 slides of arrows pointing and a thing, this was never mentioned. It's just a variable. What does it store? A number. What's the number? It's the address. And I love this. Oh, this, is, this sentence is great. It contains the address of a variable. It doesn't say another variable. It can't contain the address of itself. Uh, it's, it's, a, mm, it's a lovely sentence. So variables, they store numbers. This I knew. I knew that. If someone would ask me, What's our address? I would say, it's just a number. Don't worry about it. But I never made the connection because I was fixed on that hammered in box and arrow mental model. It's not magic because there's no such thing as magic. <laughs> I had to make that gift myself. There was no high quality version of this. Also, go see the movie. It's a good movie. <laughs> so, Mental models are very important. We use them every day, I hope. 
and especially when you're starting to learn a specific topic. Because a metal model can be the springboard you need to learn more. But it can also harm if vital aspects are missing, like in this case. So let's do a quick example. This is going to be fun. <laughs> I'm actually stressed from this example because it's a topic I'm not great at. And I'm going to say it in a field of experts. And I hope I'm correct because this is a hard topic to do. So let's do a quick example. So I would like hands. Who here knows what a monad is? <laughs> For those in the video, basically the entire room is going, eh, eh, which is me as well. Because of course a monad is a monoid in a category of endofunctors. Good night, everybody. <laughs> this is an actual Stack Overflow question from 2010, by the way. Like if you take this quote, without the duh, of course, like there's a guy who says, like his answer is this. Like, yeah, it's that. And it's, I think it's an accepted answer as well. It's hilarious. Yeah, this is not helping anybody. Well, some, I mean, if you are a category theorist, this might be like, oh, duh. Yeah, I knew that. <laughs> so let's do an example of a metal model for a monad. Is it perfect? No, absolutely not. But help me get started and might help you get started. Because now after, I think, um, I'm trying to remember where I learned this, but uh, someone told me this mental model. And after that, any time I saw anybody talking about a monad, I was like, I got my foot in the door. I can reason about the conversation. I'm not totally lost. It's still super complicated. Like the Wikipedia page is pages long. So let's say you have a huge library of standalone functions that look something like this. I modify the incoming value. I take in some complex data type by reference, call that CDT. We do some checks, right? And there could be multiple checks. If the checks fail, we bail, we stop, because we can't modify the complex data type. And after all the checks, we are allowed to modify the complex data type. Doesn't matter what it is. It could be a vector, it could be your own class. And then we're done we can return an error code OK, which is always a hilarious error code. If you do a lot of Win32 programming and uh, I think some Linux programming as well, there's error code OK. But it's such a hassle to call this function. Like, look at this. I create the complex data type, default constructor, hooray. I take out the error code, I modify the incoming value, and then, then I, I, I do some checks. I check for something bad. And if something bad happened, then we return something. And we can have many of these checks, one after another, because there could be many types of states. We want to be nice with our error handling. So then we're OK to use the complex data type. But what if you want to chain many of these functions? Because like I said before, you have a huge library of them. So, And we only want to call the next function if the previous function was successful. So we have to do something like this. We check the error code for, for the, we call the incoming value. If the error code is bad, we go away. We do our multiple error checks. And then we call the next one. I also modify and so on and so on and so on. Well, what if there was a language feature where you can chain these things together and the language would do the exception handling automatically for you? So you could just do this. This is not actual code, but we have a complex data type, and then we just go into number one, we go into number two, we go into number three, we keep on going. And we know that if any of these fail, we bail out. Is this a perfect mental model? No. But this gets you the foot in the door. Next time someone's talking about monads, like this is a part of it. This is one of the things you get from it. Is it much more? Yeah. But like, the category of endofunctors isn't helping anybody. But this kind of thing, at least, it helped me at least. So if, if it helps you, that's wonderful. And here's the big thing as well. Mental models should evolve. Once you create one, that should be, that should be uh, evolvable, basically. OK? So that was story number one. Story number two. You have to start somewhere, right? I think we all started somewhere. So in November of 2017, I decided to open up my Twitter DMs. 
That's a scary thing to do. My focus was to have a one-on-one -on -one code review with people new to programming. I didn't want anybody who was a 10-year veteran, just someone who was new and wanted to learn. So I did this. I pinned the tweet, November 2017. The main focus is um, we're here to learn, and if you are learning to program. That was the main part. So I have done over 50 of these. Uh, what I call reviews is not the quick like helps, but more of like, hey, we have a talk, we have a discussion. I count those as one review. And I've denied about the same amount as well, because either they're not beginners and, and or basically their code would take hours to review. Because some, even though I said, like here back, don't just send me your GitHub, people sent me their GitHub. So of course they did that. Um, but most contacted me didn't ask for code reviews. Just asking about, hey, what can I do to get a job? Where can I learn C++? Is my CV okay? Which is fine. I mean, what do you learn uh, regarding job hunting? Just go for it. I mean, they just say no and then you try again. Where to learn C++? That's the thing. Like, there's a site called Learn C++, which is fine. But I don't know if there's like the source for learning. I can't just link them to a CPP reference. That doesn't work. And if there's CV okay, usually the, the result was don't put so much text and don't put the job you had when you were 17. That was like the main things. But people want to fill out their CVs. So working at 7-Eleven when you were 17 is not a good CV thing to have when you're planning to be a programmer. But like I said, um, most of them weren't these kind of full code reviews. Most of them were like this. Do you know why Calc has a red underline on it? Who here has a guess what's happening? Here's the code. Count skeletons versus humans. Someone is making a game. Any, any, space. huh? Namespace. Namespace. That's a good one. No, it wasn't the case. Include. Hmm. Include missing. Include missing. No. I asked them mouse over it. What does it say? Huh? <laughs> yeah. Mouse over it. What does it say? I expected the semicolon. Now who knows what's going on? Check the line above. That fixed it. These are very common to get. Like someone just Googling, like, learn C++, help, and then they get my tweet Twitter for some example. Uh, but op having an open DM can be a negative thing, though. Uh, I got sent actually a lot of graphic photos, which might be fine if you're into that thing, but not for code reviews. No, thank you. I also got a few shady URLs sent to me. It's like, oh yes, my code is over here. Can you review it? And it's like shadyurl.com. Like, okay, no, I'm not going to review your code. And then the, the big one was, I once was asked to do a full security audit of a large application and then also be made responsible for its validity. No. <laughs> but these are very, very much a minority of contacts. Like, barely happens. Because people are very nice and respectful. Most of them are just happy to have someone talk to them about their code. That was the nice thing. Just even if I said no, people are like, oh, thank you. Like, uh, where can I go and help? And like, that's they're very happy. I've even done a few person-to-person -person Skype chats with some who have been contacting me regularly, and I even did a two-hour Skype session with an Indian university, and there were so many questions for them. Go check them out. Next Tet Lab, they're doing cool stuff. A lot of machine learning over there. So. The summary of that, things have cooled down a bit. Uh, I took all the code that I have reviewed, and I did a summary of the most common points of everything. And this is in no particular order. So this is like, if you're new, here are the things usually new programmers are doing wrong. The one function to rule them all. I do everything. I even modify global state. Then you have pages of code. Um, this seems to happen when people are taught that they should only create function when a code is reused. Then you have pages of code, like, because I'm not reusing it, it's, there's no need to do, a function, to do another function, because I'm not reusing it. Uh, which then tends to turn into the I do everything function. So we generally have a chat about, I mean, to create a function for one use is okay, because what you're doing is you're documenting it, you're isolating code, maybe you want to reuse it later. 
Uh, and even, this is a thing that shocked many of them, similar bits of code can turn into functions when generalized enough. So some would have the big function, and within the big functions you had similar-ish bits, and they didn't spot it. That, oh yeah, I can actually abstract that into a function. So The next one, one class to rule them all. I contain all the code, and Visual Studio sometimes crashes when it opens. So much code. So, okay, now we have multiple functions, but now we have all the states in one place. And I think this is insecurity about how to abstract, and the main thing is how to access data from another location. Because you have your class, you have your state, and then you want to store data somewhere else, you might be insecure of where should I put it? Can I have it somewhere else? I just want, I want my code with me. It's super nice. Okay? Okay, who's ready for, for, for code? I don't think you're ready. So, the pyramid of death. So, we have a function that takes in some state and then takes in a vector, of course, by value. Um, we check if you're, we can't be in the invalid state. That's, of course, can't be true. The, the list can't be empty, of course, of course. And then for some of the loop, we need to be in a small state. I'm just, I want to create a big triangle here, uh, the pyramid. And then you have more stuff below because this is, of course, one function to rule them all. So usually what we talk about is we do what I call bouncers or exit points. So if you are in the valid state or if the list is empty, go away. But I feel this comes with insecurity with the AND AND operators and the OR operators. But I think this is also a natural way of how you talk about your code. So for us, this is normal. But for human beings, no, I'm <laughs> this is normal. <laughs> because they think like this, to loop through the list, we can't be in an invalid state. And the list can't be empty, and we only do this loop if we're in a small state. So if you're talking about the code, that's what you create. You create the pyramid because you do these checks. Instead of r saying, if you are invalid or the list is empty, we will exit the function, which is not a normal speaking style. So if someone is new to programming and sitting down and thinking, uh, they, like, they use their own speaking style. So they might write code that looks like their own speaking style. Okay? Magic. Is magic real? Like we said before, no, magic is not real. So this I saw a lot. Just a number, number five. It's not a, it's not a big point, but this usually causes problems when they want to refactor things that they have a magic number. Uh, I always love this one. It doesn't, it's not directly connected, but like it's zero, one, or infinity. The number two doesn't exist. Uh, we know that checking against zero, oh, echo again, sorry. We know that checking against zero is commonplace. We don't need the context for that. Similar to one, sometimes in two, if you want to do every other, that's sometimes fine. But any other number in my eyes is magic and needs to be given context. Because is the number five the number of threads? Is it the number of seconds until you retry again? Or is it the number of users in a group? There's no context, it's just a number. Okay, the next one, inconsistent formatting. And this is uh, quite common with people who are very, very new. So this is common, yeah, very with programming. I tell them the formatting style you use, it doesn't matter. The compiler couldn't care less about how you format. It's gonna parse it, errors and all. Just be consistent. I like this. <laughs> do, 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 do. <laughs> Who, ha who has this one? Underscores. Oh. <laughs> you probably use like, what's it, uh, control, control space to do the autocomplete and select from the list. At least, I don't know, in, in the Swedish uh, keyboard, is the underscore a, like one button thing? No. no, it's a shift thing, right? And in the Swedish, it's like Alt GR7 to do the curly brace, right? Why doesn't everybody have like carpal tunnel here? <laughs> no idea. Uh, okay, so next one. 
So what's going to happen now is, is the title of the slide is going to happen now, after this one. Okay, so here's the title of the slide. Comments everywhere. So below here, I'm going to have my, my, my points. Okay, so after this one, it's going to be the first point. So many comments, like pages of comments of all sorts of stuff. And here's my third point. <laughs> comments can't be helpful. But what happens is, what I think about comments is you double the state of your code. Because what I think the main problem with comments is there's nothing connecting comments to the code. It's you reading text and parsing. Who here knows what happens to comments when you compile? What does it turn into? Anyway? <laughs> we usually turn it into a single space. Just replace it with a single space. Um, I think that's in GCC. It might be in other uh, compilers. But I think it's uh, for formatting reasons it's turned into a single space. So we have the important function. We take in two values. And we don't need to check for some problem because it's always done by the caller, right? But what if it's not? And my rule for comments is that a line of comment is as important and a line as a line of code. So review appropriately. Um, for us on, uh, on the Uplay project, there's n basically no comments in the code because we abstract most things into functions. If a comment is needed, sure, but you have to give me the reason why. And we haven't seen the problem with that. So the next one is what I call a crowded question. Who, who recognizes something like this? We, need to, we have a foo, we need to ask if it's a thing, but we're constructing the stuff in the argument and we're getting something and we have a magic value and blah, blah, blah. I mean, if you're blocking execution with and, I can understand you. But usually for the new programmers, that was not the case. So for readability and maintainability, this is a strain for anybody who comes across it. And then the last one is a, what I call stringly typed. Who recognizes this kind of code? I hear sighs and laughter in the crowd, so I know that. Uh, mainly avoid depending on information stored in the string, um, unless you're actually doing string parsing, or converting from a string source to a type source. Like if you're coming from a database, you're usually converting from a string source. Uh, but for those uh, newer people, they were not doing that. I mean, use types, classes, enums, help even integers. Just something that will yell at you compile time. Because um, stringly typed is a very common way of turning compile time errors into a runtime crash. So these mistakes have a common theme, which is kind of a duh, lack of experience and practice. Well, duh. But I've seen these mistakes done by 10-year veterans. But the thing is, they're more nuanced. It's the same idea, kinda. Like, we found in Fix the Crash the new play that was stringly typed. If I would have shown you the code, you wouldn't say this is stringly typed, because of course there was templates everywhere. Um, and then that was like, it, it caused a crash if you modified a line of code, but didn't modify it in every, every place, you would have this crash. And I've seen a gigantic fun function in the ATC code, because splitting it up was harder to prove correct. That's also another, like, you see bad practice, but the reason is not, I'm not experienced, the reason is it's harder to prove correct. So you get, you get different things. So, story number three, invisible problems. So, I think we can do this. Let's imagine that we are a C++ programmer. We, we're an okay programmer, we're not the greatest. We get by, we get paid. And we are tasked with upgrading a part of an older system. And in the section we are now working on today, the best solution is a struct with two integers. Think we can do this? We can do this. So let's do this. We create a very important struct. Cool? Everybody with me? Good. We put in the two integers. Again? Yes. Great. So far, so good. And then someone tells us, can, can you make sure that everything is correctly initialized? We can't have any junk values here. This is a very important struct. 
Okay. I mean, zero is default, right? Right? Has to be. So we create a, a default constructor. One is zero, two is zero. Great. And then someone tells us, I, I kind of want to be able to set the values when I create the object, not after I create the object. It's kind of nice to like create it in line. Okay, we got this, we got this. Okay. We're good? We're good. Cool. Oh no. Someone tells us, can you make sure when the object is copied that it's correct when it's copied? It has to be correct when it's copied. And again, we're not that experienced with the language. So the rule of how many? So we have the copy constructor, okay? And then the copy operator as well. Who here knows why I'm not doing the, the if this Fleur de Fleur thing? Mm -hmm. There you go. If you're doing more than a couple of ints, uh, it might be okay. But like doing an if in an initialization might be a little too much. And it, it's two ints, just put the value there. Compiles and runs, seems to be happy. Okay, who is this person? Then someone tells us, hey, we've upgraded to the new compiler. It's got move semantics. C can you make sure that everything is movable? Oh God, where are we now? Uh, so we have a move constructor. I'm not sure how to delete the old guy, so I just don't do it, right? Because I'm not that great at the language. And then I have the move operator as well. Who here notices the one thing that's like, the copy constructor, the move constructor, the copy operator, and the move operator are basically the same thing, just with different overloads. Okay, we're, we're getting to the edge of our knowledge here, but we got this, we got this. It compiles, we commit, seems to be happy, but then we get a call. What have I done? Why is our new very important struct slower than our old library? Oh God, I don't know. So the searching starts. We look over our code, no, nothing there. We look at all the call sites that are using the code, nothing there. We're doing git blame diffs now. It's not great. Who can we blame for this? <laughs> and then it happens. We go into assembly. And that's always a scary point, right? Who here is great at reading assembly? Who's, who's awesome at assembly? We have two hands, three hands, great. <laughs> I'm not even gonna raise my hands. But there's a thing you notice. You take the old one that worked and was fast, and you go, you get the generated assembly for that one, and then you get your new one. And the only difference is that in the old fast one, you see this, memcopy. You don't see memcopy in your code. Okay, I can't be over here, because there's some, okay. Technology. <laughs> you don't see memcopy in your new code. Okay, now, now we're in trouble. This is way out of our water. I mean, imagine, like we are just some, like we're okay at, at programming. We're not, we're not uh, Bjarne here. Okay, so what we do? We, we Google, Google this. Why is my code slow? <laughs> and you sprinkle in memcopy and structs just to, just to try to save yourself, right? But a certain word keeps popping up. Who here might know what word that is? Because there might be someone here that knows what's going on. Nobody? Trivial. There you go. Objects of trivially copyable types are the only C++ objects that may be safely copied with memcopy. Okay. So what's trivially copyable? Well, duh. Okay, next slide. <laughs> so, Every copy constructor is trivial or deleted. Move, copy, move assignment, copy assignment. We need to be, have at least one of these not deleted. So one of these has to be at, uh, set. And we need to have a trivial non-deleted constructor. And that also implies that we have no virtual functions or virtual base classes. But look at this. We don't have anything virtual. And in my eyes, this is trivial. Right? <laughs> I'm not doing any logic here. This is very trivial. Wait, okay, so, wait, so what am I allowed to do? 
What is trivial? Well, trivial is a trivial copy constructor is not one made by the user. Okay, so I can't have that one, so strike that off the list. A trivial move constructor is not one made by the user. Okay, strike that one off the list. A trivial copy assignment is not one made by the user. Strike that one. And a trivial move assignment operator is not one made by the user. Strike that one. So we're back to this guy. This is trivial, according to, or trivially copyable. And does it matter? Yes. Yes, it does. And if I take this struct and turn one of these guys into, well, I can't do that as well, into a pointer, um, I will go back to the red one. Just by adding one star, I will hit the non-trivial one. Yes, sir? Um, the equals default, um, you mean operator equals there? Yeah, that's the trivial, that's the trivial copy assignment operator. You can have that one. Yes, it behaves the same way as the copy constructor. Yeah, so we're back here and it really doesn't, does matter. So how many of your objects are actually trivial? Because you might not be hitting this thing here. But there's a catch. When I did this research the first time, I thought, hey, I want to be trivial. So there's a thing called is trivial. And I thought that was the thing you have to use, is trivial, cool. And is trivial is trivially copyable, okay, and trivially default constructable. And trivially default constructable is quite the beast. You're not allowed to default initialize anything anything. This? No. This? No. Not allowed. And to what benefit? I actually don't know. There are some talks of people arguing on Clang forums about what is allowed to be used in a con stack for context, but no, I actually don't know. So if you do know, I would love to hear that. So what is the only healthy choice to do now? Because I want trivially copyable. I want fast code, right? Who doesn't? So I did a thing with the help of Mr. Bjorn over here, because he was the only one on Twitter that stepped up when I wanted to create a macro. I enforced trivial, which is the, the, the six trivial ones. I create a trivial struct. You remember this, I think? Yes, he does. Because I, I didn't know how to use the VA arcs. Cause that's scary to me. Good for you. <laughs> But yeah, now I can say trivial struct, and I actually will get a compile time error now if, my, if I create structs or classes, if I do that, which aren't trivial. So that's nice, right? No, it's not nice. <laughs> okay, so last story. Old mental models, because we talked about they have to. Did, did that pass the compiles? Yeah, that, that compiles. Yes. That works. I tried uh, GCC, eight point something, Clang, the latest, or Clang Trunk, and Visual Studio 17. And these all compile without any warnings. It's basically what I'm doing is I'm creating the class and then I'm putting a bunch of static asserts after the class. So if you want to do that manually, you can do that. But this, hey, a macro. Don't use macros. This is scary. But it works. And the cool thing as well is you can use the very important struct in other uh, structs that are trivial, and they're also trivial because they are trivialists. Trivial likes trivial, basically. So, old mental models. Copy, listen, RVO, NRVO, oh my. So, what does NRVO stand for? Thank you, very nice. My question is, what are we optimizing? Copy. Why is that an optimization? Any? No. Because you can trust the values that the code Yeah. So we can reuse values. We don't have to generate new memory. Okay. And here's a question. Is copy elution ever guaranteed? Yeah, in 17. Yeah. Context for in constant expression and constant initialization, all copy elision is guaranteed. Note, this is specified by 
post-14 defect report to 2022, but which may be reversed pending decision of, of CVT 2278. For someone learning a language, what is this? I just want to be sure that I'm not wasting memory. This is not, this is not great. So what is 2278? Well, you can't have a C++ talk without having Richard Smith, right? My resolution of 2022 does not work. As it is mathematically impossible to guarantee named return value optimization in all cases. Dun, dun, dun. CVG concurred with the suggested direction in March. Uh oh. So it might not be always guaranteed. Look at this class. So you have a global const B. When you create B, you create a self pointer to this. And then in the function B, you create a B. And if they're equal, you make a new B. So you're guaranteeing that it can't be the same. So you can't return correctly. So that's fun. I think that's funny. So, I mean, RVO, we're back to pointers, right? For me, I understood them fine, but I never knew when they applied. So we're back to square one. I feel okay with this thing, but I'm not, like I have to go to Compiler Explorer and make sure that, yeah, this is actually RVO. Yeah, so what's RVO, what's not RVO? So, so here's the thing. I saw John Kalb's lightning talk on copy edition. And look at the boxes and arrows. But here's the thing, it's four minutes and 52 seconds. And what I'm gonna do is, this is a call to action. I'm not gonna spoil the talk. This is your homework. Go watch that talk. Because it changed how I thought about copy edition. Here's the name of the game. C++ Now 2018, John Kalb, Copy Edition. It's a wonderful talk and short. So go do your homework. So now what? By the way, this has been 40 minutes. <laughs> For me, time has flown by. So we all learn differently and we all teach differently. Even chatting with coworkers about something, we are teaching, basically. So when something seems confusing to someone else, try explaining it in a completely different manner. You might learn something about it yourself. Or, as my favorite quote said, what's really the point of trying to teach somebody to anybody? What I mean is, if you really want to understand something, the best way is to try to explain it to someone else. Because this forces you to sort it out in your mind. And then the more slow and dim-witted your pupil, that's kind of a rude thing to say to someone, the more things you have to break it down to more simple ideas. And that's the essence of programming, right? By the time you've sorted out a complicated idea into small steps that even a stupid machine can deal with, you've learned something about it yourself. Which, or in other ways, never stop learning and never stop teaching. Thank you.